George. We're here, and it's uh, still working, I guess. I still working, I guess. <laughs> it's almost there. Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes, for crying out loud, of course, of course, we're here, and everything is there. I, I almost, uh, uh, it's a funny thing, I, uh, I was deluged with, uh, with, uh, with the demonstration fans uh, here the last couple of days uh, saying that that demonstration, which I instigated outside of a high school in the Midwest 250 years ago, was one of the most stirring stories they've heard since The Will to Succeed by Horatio Alger or Sam the Young Shortstop. Uh, I could tell you of other, I'll never forget. Did, you know, it's, it's funny when, when the first time you really see, uh, something happening in the world which later becomes a, a median or even becomes the norm. Did I ever tell you about old Albert Farkas? Did I ever mention Albert Farkas on the show at all? I did talk about Farkas. All right. Uh, no, did I really? What did I say about Albert Farkas? I don't remember because I hated his guts. Huh? I don't recall. You go, e uh. I, I don't remember mentioning Albert Farkas, but if I did, all right, I did mention Albert Farkas. But let me tell you about Farkas one day. Farkas was the, the, uh, the class's strong man and thug. And, uh, <laughs> every class, of course, has one, and I didn't, didn't recognize at the time, though, that, that Farkas was way before his time, and if he were around today, there would be social workers, there would be sociologists, there would be psychologists swarming over him. He would become, in a way, the modern hero. Uh, Farkas was just a lout in those days. And, and uh, Farkas, I remember one time, Miss Robinette. Uh, yeah, yeah, Farkas chased me in the a p one time. Well, that's not the, all that Farkas did. I remember one time Farkas, yeah, he chased me in the a p but I will have to say this. Farkas had, had, an, had two other louts with him. Harold Dill was Farkas's buddy. And along with Harold Dill was a guy named Bud Blue. And uh, one time I, f I went out of my absolute skull and had a gigantic fist fight with Bud Blue in the woods, which we <laughs> talk about. It was, it was a very strange feeling, you know, to find yourself in a fist fight with a guy that's been bullying you for 150 years and bullying everybody. And he was he, This guy would come along and he'd hit fire plugs. I mean, he, he had everything bullied. He had parking meters bullied. He had... He had, he had buildings that would scare me, scared of him and everything. But Blue, and one time I just went out of my got a big fist fight, and I, I, I jumped on Bud Blue in the woods. And the next thing I knew, I'm on top of Bud Blue and hitting him and bumping his head against the rock. And I got, uh, suddenly I realized that I'm on top of the bully, and I got scared at that minute. Oh, what am I doing here? And right at that minute, I chickened out and got one in the ear. You know, it's, <laughs> believe me, the minute you're aware of what you're doing, you're dead. It's like when you're acting on a stage. The minute you're saying, gee, I'm out of here, there's 2,000 people. I'm, and to be or not to be, that is the question. The next thing, whoa, 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 whoa. you look up on the balcony, you look out, you hear the guy selling tickets. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. If Mr. Chapman is out there in the audience, if Richard Watts is in the audience, you are going right back to the unemployment line tomorrow night after the clinker closes. It's a, it's that knowledge, it's that understanding yourself. So I'll, I'll tell you about Farkas, how I was in on the beginning of a whole new wave of things. I never realized until this time, of course, or I've, time to time I had intimations, that, that Farkas was a, he's truly avant-garde. You know, we always think of the avant-garde as, as artists and writers. Oh, no. There's another kind of avant-garde. Completely. Farkas is sitting in the class there with Miss Robinette, and Miss Robinette was one of these rounded teachers. I'll tell you what she looked like. You ever see a, b a very bad comic strip named Dixie Dugan? Well, Miss Robinette looked like Dixie Dugan. She had big round eyes, sort of like Ella Sinders type eyes, Abby and Slats, you know. And uh, she was she had a she was rounded all over, and she was a great yeah oh yeah she was one of the very few teachers I look back upon now and realize that had I known now what I know now, well, wait a minute, it's the other way. Had I known then what I know now, well, I guess I still would have had trouble in geography. It wouldn't have made much difference because I still would have been three feet six, and it wouldn't have worked out. It doesn't make any difference. So I'm sitting there one day in class, and everybody is sitting in class, and it's in, it's in uh, uh, Miss uh, Robinette taught fourth grade, fifth grade, fourth grade. How old are you when you're in fifth grade? Fifth grade it was. How old are you? I don't recall you. It's all those ten? All right, we're all sitting there. We're in fifth grade. And Farkas has been getting a little funny. You know, Farkas, up to, uh, about, about up to fourth grade, 
third grade or so, Farkas would just hit guys out in the playground. You know, he'd hit guys and uh, he'd throw rocks at stuff and bust windows. Once in a while, he'd he had a he had a big gimmick where he would run along with a with a stick with a nail on it and scratch cars. That was oh, oh yes, that was a big funny bit. Oh boy, listen, let me tell you, my old man one time grabbed him by the back of the neck. And it was the first time I ever saw a kid look directly between his own shoulder blades. My old man just twisted his head right around. You could hear everything squeaking in him. And, uh, well, that was when he scratched the Graham Page. But uh, Farkas was, was one of those guys. And he was sandy-haired, kind of big for his age, and truculent. It's the only word. Isn't that a great word, truculent? Truculent. Truculent describes a couple of newscasters I know. Good evening, Americans! Everywhere! And, you know, really, really, they, they've got a, there's a great phrase that is used in America. I don't think it's used anywhere else. It has to do with some place where you've got a bug. Uh, anyway, that describes guys that are truculent. I'd love to describe that more. That comes later in the semester, later on. But, but here, here's old Farkas one day, and the wind is blowing in through the Venetian blinds. Everything is calm and peaceful at the Warren G. Harding, <laughs> the Warren G. Harding grade school. And, and uh, all you could smell was chalk dust in the air. And Miss Robinette, she had a kind of a vaguely uh, uh, night in Paris smell about her. You know, there's certain teachers like that. that and, and she was up there and looking great and walking around and talking. I don't know. I recall exactly the incident that happened. It was just part of that great thing, that great thing of grade school. Do you, do you, can you remember anything really specifically of it? Just a kind of a big, long... Time. Once in a while, there'd be terrible moments when you thought you were going to fail or you uh, fist fights. And but you can't really pick it out. It's there. It's like a, a tape with with sort of sounds and music and bangings and clinks and thumps on it. And it goes on and on in your mind. And you rarely even recognize that that tape is still there to be played. It's like old records in your in your record collection you never play anymore. Old ties, Ed, of which you have 400 that you never wear anymore. You don't even remember buying them. You don't know how they got there. They're just a rotten old tie. I let it die. And you must have had a moment when it meant something. It must have meant a, 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 at least for somebody. And you don't remember where you got it or anything. It's like old Christmases and old birthdays and old shirts that you can't forget. Well, all right, the grade school is like that with most of us. It's hard to believe we all went there. So I'm, I'm sitting there one day. All the kids are all lined up. I can see this, the scene in my mic is a really burst like a shot on everybody. Farkas is sitting over by the, right by the windows, and there's a whole long row of seats. He's over there by the windows. He's about, about three or four desks back from the front. And now I, I'm S. I'm way in the back there. I'm sitting way back there by Dawn Strickland, and by that crew, and well, we're sitting way in the back there. So we didn't get the news as soon as possible. Always, we, you know, the, the stuff that was really happening in the front would ripple back and find it would, would arrive back in the outer precincts back there. I, I have a firm belief that nobody whose name is 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 way at the end of the alphabet ever gets to be president. Uh, it's a rare thing. No, it's a rare thing, Zay Jack. <laughs> I'm telling you. Look at you. I'll tell you. You got a long way to go. Leader is entrenched, Dad. He's way ahead of you in the alphabet. Very few guys whose names begin with it. I don't know how Washington ever made it. He made it long before they even had rows and things where you sat in the back and alphabetical lists and stuff. But I'm sitting in the back there along with Don Strickland, along with Jack Robertson. Oh, boy, what a lot. Robertson was Mona Robertson. Uh, Mona Robertson was famous for <laughs> She won an Indian blanket once. Uh, yeah, she won an Indian blanket once from a traveling, a traveling carnival. She won an Indian blanket doing jitterbugging. And, and, oh, yeah, she jitterbugged. I'll tell you, that chick was, was completely out of her skull. I, I won an Indian blanket. I, don't, I wonder if she ever tells her kids now about the time. <laughs> well, I've, uh, some that asked me to tell you about the time Mona Robertson did, went, went up on top of the stage there at the traveling carnival and won the jitterbugging contest. And it was, well, I'll tell you, it was very embarrassing because, you know, we're all standing down there and kids have a certain attitude towards one another when they're in about sixth and seventh, fifth grade, you know, especially when they're boys looking at girls. Well, it was very embarrassing and yet it was a great moment because Mona Robertson had a, you know how they, how they used to do a jitterbug stuff? Well, she was jitterbugging like mad with a guy who was about three grades ahead of us who was just a myth. About this. His name was Lawrence Stryker. He was a myth. He was about nine and a half feet tall. And he was one of these guys. You've seen movies of him jitterbugging. Well, she was jitterbugging. She was about 
in sixth grade, I think, fifth grade, sixth grade, sixth grade, roughly. Maybe she was 10 or 12, maybe 11 or 12, something like that. And she's jitterbugging like mad. And it was that night that everybody realized that Mona Robertson wore black panties. And what a fantastic sensation that caused and at the Warren G. Harding School. I mean, would you, wow, you know, and, and, you know, it's terrible. All of us, kids, panties were just rumors with us. Uh, well, the kids, it was just things we saw in ads and Sears Robot catalogs, and all of a sudden we saw them on Mona. And, uh, wow, we, uh, <laughs> oh, boy, that, that seared many a guy's psyche forever, you know. But, but Mona was sitting there, and so was Jack Roberts and all of us sitting on the back there. We don't know what happened. It was a wild thing because rumors went, went back and forth afterwards about what, what occurred. But suddenly you heard a sort of snorting sound, <laughs> like that. And, and we look at well, what's, what's going on. And it, it was quiet. Everybody sort of working away. You know, you're just going on forever. You, you, you're in a routine. <laughs> and over up in the front there, by the windows where the breeze was coming in off the lake, and it was sort of soft and halfway warm winter day, you know, those days when everything is melting a little bit and it gets cold and it melts, and you can see the big old icicles hanging out there and the sun is shining down. Farkas has done something. I don't know what he's done, but he, he's, he's made a, a, a sort of funny, sort of an angry noise about four or five kids from the front. Well, with that, Miss Robinette, Miss Robinette is over by the window. Miss Robinette says something to Farkas. She says, will you stop that now, Albert? Once more like that, and you're going to go and see Miss Norton. Well, there is a, a, a sort of a peg, very hanging, pregnant pause for a minute there. And we're, we're, this is just a routine ac action, you know, a routine action in in fifth grade, a routine moment. Would you cut it out now, Albert? Once more, and you're going in to see Miss Norton. Well, we're still down there. I'm fooling around, and I'm looking at Mona, and Mona's looking over at somebody else, and Strickland is, is talking to someone else, and don't, you know, we're just sort of back there. And all of a sudden, without any warning, Farkas jumps up and he has a pencil. He has a red pencil. And he takes this pencil and he throws it at Miss Robinette. Boom, pow, and the pencil bounces off the wall, bangs around by the desk and under the scoop like that. And, oh, boy, what a fantastic moment. And everybody, just it's just like somebody busted a light bulb. There's a moment where I'm sitting there. Boy, what silence. And Farkas is up on his feet, and he is hurling obscenities. Now, remember, this is about in fifth grade. Ah, oh, what do you mean? Damn it! No, no. He's yelling like that, and this kid's ears are red. He is a real nut, and he's out of his skull. Well, Miss Robinette looks down at Farkas, and Farkas takes something else from his desk, a pen or something. He throws it up at her, just throws it like mad, and she makes a sort of a move toward him, and he charges. He charges like a bull. Yeah, he charges her. He puts his head down and he yells. Well, we had seen this scene many a time out at the, out at the, you know, this is a scene that all of us were familiar with. This was the Farkas move. In fact, uh, this, yeah, this later became very popular with the Chicago Bears and they're still using it. Farkas would pull his head down like a turtle between his shoulder blades and go, hey, oh, damn you! Whoa! And he goes down right at you and boy, he would catch you right below the ribs and you're dead. You don't know what to do. You can't hit him. What are you going to do? Hit him on top of the head or kick him in the mouth or what? He'd get you like a cannonball before you could turn around. Well, Farkas pulls the Farkas move right there, and he goes, Woo! And, and with that, Miss, <laughs> Miss Robinette looks with her big old eyeballs, and she catches a glancing blow. She moved quickly. Uh, I will say this for Miss Robinette. She was known for her folk dancing. She had the chorus, you know, the classes. So she saw something. Was, she makes a quick move. She catches a glancing blow on the left hip, and Farkas bounces off, ricochets into the blackboard, bangs into the ferns and knocks over 19. Boom! The ferns go down, and Farkas turns, and he lets another bellow out. Woo! And he goes, oh, you know, he goes charging again. Nobody knows what the devil's going on. We're sitting there, you know, our eyeballs are bugging. <laughs> Speaking of bulls, this is W-O-R-A-M and F-M, New York. Well, our eyeballs are bugging out with, and, and Miss, Miss Robinette is, is uh, on the verge of a stage. What are you doing? Will you sit, sit up? Oh, he bellows like that. Well, he charges at her. Miss Robinette goes around the desk, and, and she is in full flight now. Obviously, she is, she, you know, she's never encountered this. This was not taught at, at uh, normal school, you know. They didn't have anything like this at teacher's college. They did not teach how to get rid of the Farkas charge. <laughs> you know, there was a, you know a, a great moment there. And so Farkas comes bellowing again. Round the desk he goes. 
And Pakistan realizes, apparently, in his, in his antediluvian primordial brain, that dimwit, chowder-headed brain, he begins to perceive that maybe what he was doing was a little wrong, but by now he was committed. You know, it was like, it was like Joe Miniacci, the famous Chicago Bear <laughs> halfback. When he would fumble, he would just kick people. You know, once he's made a mistake, he just kicks people in the mouth. You see, somehow it's going to ex expiate his sin. So with that, Farkas yells down at all the kids, and all of you, too, damn you! With that, he turns, Miss Miss Robin, or whatever, he, he runs out the door, boom, you hear him going down the hall. And he stands, he goes tearing around, He's outside now. He goes outside of the school. It was one of these, you know, you know what they call portable buildings, the wooden buildings. Farkas is standing outside, hollering in. He's all right, 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 right. Well, Miss Miss Robinette goes tearing down to the office, <laughs> and we're all sitting there stunned. Not one of that was one, the one great moment when none of us knew how to handle it. You know, you just can't because we had known the Farkas charge. We had known it. And, and we also recognized, too, that here was a genuine breach of authority. This was, this was, you could not be kidded. It was absolutely genuine. Miss Robinette goes down, you hear her appeals. <laughs> down, the, down the hall to Miss, Miss Norton, you know. Miss Norton was the forerunner to the new English stainless steel razor blades. Miss Norton, I'll tell you, had a cutting edge dad that just did not stop. Miss Norton. I'll tell you about the time Miss Norton's girdle fell down at the PTO. <laughs> Yeah, it's the truth. It was a very funny. Very few, very few of the people who were there knew what had happened. But as a sousaphone player in the band, I saw. I was right there. But Miss Miss Norton goes tearing out into the heart, and the kid goes. You know, he goes down the alley, and that was the end of it. Well, silence hung over the Warren G. Harding grade school. It just hung there for about fifteen seconds, something like that. And with that, Miss Miss Robinette comes back. You could hear her heels coming back, and she comes back into the classroom. And all the kids are sitting there, Robin, Strickland, and uh, Schwartz, and Flick, and they're all sitting there. They Kind of funny, their heads are pulled down, and there's that big, fat, empty seat where Farkas has rocketed out with his head between his shoulders with a fantastic Farkas charge and has disappeared in the direction of Flick's tavern. He's gone. You know, he's down in the alley. We're sitting there. Well, Miss Robinette comes in. And she stands in front of the class for a couple of seconds and says something to the class, some little triviality, like, well, now let's all, now let's get back to work, children. And she sits down at her desk, and all of a sudden, she starts to cry. Oh, my God. I'm telling it. She starts to cry, and she puts her head down on the desk, and all of us were sitting there, and, and she has a box of Kleenex, and she starts taking out the Kleenex, and she's absolutely, she just completely dissolved. And we're all sitting there. And, you know, Schwartz was, you know, Schwartz was about to move in, you know, where Farkas had left off. He was about to pick up the, the cudgels, you know, and everybody, you know, there's a, that, 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 you know, it's just like, it's like the, the French Revolution. You break one thing and the next thing you want to cut everybody's heads off. And everyone's sort of feeling, oh boy, wow, you know. And she is crying and everybody's sitting there. Well, Robins, Robertson is sitting in front of me. He kind of looks around and Mona Robertson's like in the Schwartz and the kids are sort of itching. You know? And she cries and cries. With that, she gets up and she says, well, I, I'm, I'm very sorry, boys and girls. Now, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's, it's absolutely nothing. She says, I'll be, I'll be right back. And she goes out of the room and we sat there. And we're just sitting in the silence and, oh boy, what a rotten feeling. I still remember how how crummy everybody felt because up to that point, you know, she's the T. She's sort of vaguely the enemy. And she is crying and she goes out of the room and obviously she's uh, headed down towards the ladies' room and she has disappeared in the general direction of that room. And we're sitting there. And you know that funny, long afternoon silences that they're in grade schools? We're sitting there and suddenly in the distance in the woods, on the other end of the playground, we hear that nut fark as he yells, He's in the woods now, and he's yelling. You can hear him yelling. And there's absolute dead silence. We're sitting in there. On one side is the devil, and on the other side is the deep blue sea, and Farkas is screaming it out. Well, he stops. And it was dead. And nothing. It's just sort of hanging there. And we can hear Miss Robinette coming back, and she comes back, and you know that look that people have that they've just washed their face? And, and she's just washed her face, and she's combed her hair, and there's kind of redness around her eyes. 
Well, I was sitting there, and Miss Robinette says, Now, uh, I want all of you to pass your papers uh, in English forward. We... And the kids are going real hard. They're going through their notebooks, you know, working with the English. And saying, oh, Miss Robinette, uh, Miss Robinette, about about uh, the second sentence in the assignment there, where we're, uh, the, the adverbial clause, I, I, I couldn't... Miss Robinette says, well, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, Jack. The adverbial clause in that sentence, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult clause. And out in the distance we can hear, and nobody is paying a bit of attention to it. Everybody's looking the other way. You can hear out there. <laughs> and uh, uh, children, uh, I, I, we're going to start a new chapter today in arithmetic. And I want all of you to get out your arithmetic books now because we're going to have some special reading. And her eyes were red and her face was white and all washed. And you could smell her. She put some fresh perfume on. And all you could hear in the classroom, you couldn't hear her talk, you couldn't hear the kids write, all you could hear was... classroom realized that we were on the threshold of a new world. Farkas was the first avant-garde kid. Yeah, now I don't know why I told you that story. That is, it's none of your business, actually. I don't know why I told any of you that because probably somewhere Miss Robinette is still having troubles with that problem. She probably got married and has kids that are doing the same thing now. <laughs> oh yeah, you know that that problem of the born of the leader who has no leadership talents is really one of the saddest things I've ever known in my life. I mean, this, this story has been written many times over the Queeg episode, you know, and uh, Mr. Roberts, the captain and Mr. Roberts. Let me tell you, did I ever tell you about the, the, the second lieutenant that we had who, 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 believe me, he was about as much of a leader as Mr. Peepers. No, worse. No, no, I'll tell you, Mr. Peepers is tough compared to this guy, but he looked tough. There is something. No, this guy was square jawed. He had he had blue jowls. Ed, he had steely eyes. He was muscular. He wore he wore his steel helmet. Let me tell you, Rip Torn never looked tougher. He wore his steel helmet. You know. <laughs> and the instant this poor slob arrived, this would make a a great, really a, a great TV story uh, because because it was it was a funny. It's it's hard to ex to, to really explain it or to describe it. But the minute that this exec arrived, there was a thing, an electric thrill went through the entire company. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Oh, wowie. Woo Fun. At long last. Woo oh, boy, oh, boy. No more service club. No more USO dances. Now we have real fun. Well, this guy, uh, this is the way it went. I'll tell you exactly how it happened. This, again, this is a, a in connection with Miss Robinette. Next one. I, I feel so sad to see guys running for the presidency who have no leadership qualities at all. You know, I see this lieutenant in so many of them. They talk big. They got great plans. But there's a thing in the eye. I don't know what it is. As an old ex, as an old ex, rotten, decadent corporal, I can tell a non-officer a mile away. I don't care how many stars he's got. Really, I don't. It's just, you never fool the EM. You really don't. Well, I'll tell you how it happened. It's a funny thing. We had had we had had a West Point captain. Oh boy, was he GI. He was GI and everything except that he was insane alcoholic. When when this <laughs> when this guy was not on the bottle, he was great. He was a great you know, he was a terrific officer. But when he was when he was on the bottle, forget it. This guy was just a great big lunk from Iowa. And he'd yell and holler and, and he'd ride around on the front of the Jeep. He would get the guys to drive for some reason or other he'd like the wind to blow on him. And he would get the guys to yeah uh, to drive the jeep around, and he would sit on the hood, 
and he would sit on the hood and with his feet on the bumper in the front, you know, that big bumper, and he'd drive down, right down the middle of the company street, wearing his helmet and the whole business, you know, he'd yell and holler, well, this is when he was drunk. But when he was, uh, all, even then, though, he had qualities of leadership, you know, he'd say, hey, get a jeep out! Boy, would the guys get the jeep out. I mean, <laughs> not because of anything that he did to you, but because of, I don't know, the way he was. I don't know what it was. He'd say, hey, let's drive the jeep in the river. How all of us? Forty feet deep. Let's go forward. Well, end of the river, the jeep would go a hundred feet down, and the guys would all be swimming in formation, you know, <laughs> just, just automatic. But one, th one day, something happened. The word got back to the Pentagon or something, and this guy was transferred to some place, oh, way, Helen God, where, you know, some place where he was going to do no harm, and they brought into our outfit a GI, a truly GI, VMI graduate, ROTC, real southern chicken outfit colonel. And he came in, and he immediately sent out all the officers that were all replaced, and we got a really tough first lieutenant. Well, he didn't really have qualities of leadership. He just had a heavy foot. Uh, I, mean, you, you, I mean, if you just looked at him sideways, thump, you'd get one on the backside. Well, not, not literally, but actually. If I, oh, let me tell you, I worked my fingers on the bone in the grease pit because it's just a look in the face I've got. You see, I have a look in the eye that, that makes everybody suspicious automatically. Well, this guy had me in the grease pit from the time he arrived in the company. I was down in the grease pit shoveling stuff. Oh, and I, oh yeah, I, had all, I, I, I spent more time polishing pool balls in the day room. He'd assign me to that one. Have you ever done that one? Polish the pool balls, Corporal. I think you'll like that for a while. <laughs> well, you know, I'm in the polish of the pool balls. And once in a while, he'd open the door and he'd say, How are the pool balls, Corporal? Very good. I hope you're especially solicitous with the eight ball. Very good, Corporal. And he'd slam the door and... <laughs> he never broke me, though. I can't figure it out. I, I always remain Corporal, but he always... Corporal? He'd go like that. <laughs> and there were 19 other corporals in the company, but when he hollered, Corporal, they knew who it was. And so I said, yeah, what, what do you want? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Corporal, would you please go down to the supply room, and would you please tell Sergeant McClary that you would like four mops, four mops, one of them for yourself. Tell him you want the large one for yourself. Corporal, go now. All right. So, all right, everything is going along. You know, it's, it's kind of rotten. We just accepted that. That's the way it was. You, you know, you always know one thing about the Army, especially when you're in for the duration plus God knows how long. You know, the duration plus six months. I said that meant eternity plus six more days in heaven or someplace. You were still in the Army even when you were dead for six months. So, so the, the, everybody, you know, you just know that the, one thing in the Army, it's going to change. That's it. You know one thing, this guy's going to go, and that guy's going to come. You're going to have a rotten time now. You're going to have a good time the next time. It's going to be rotten, good, rotten, good. You just know that. So you don't really have the despair that a guy who was in, say, for two years, or, you know, a draftee that's just in for six months, who has terrible despair, a guy who's in the Army and just accepts it as his life, he knows now that this is his life. So he just says, ah, Corporal! So I was always there. Corporal, I, I, I still hear, sometimes when I'm asleep, once in a while, I hear a PA system in my mind, you know, that talkback system in the barracks. Corporal! Corporal, would you come to the orderly room? Quick! Well, you know, you're going to wonder, oh, okay, okay, I'm going to run down. What do you want? Oh, okay. <laughs> Should I tell you about the time that we took to answering back? You know, it was a two-way thing. And, and guys would walk in, you see, and they, they had a special way of disguising. You know how they disguise their voices on What's My Line? Well, guys took to doing all kinds of funny voices. And they would walk in, and they would just, without, any, without saying anything, they would just stick their head in, in any barracks. See, because the, the, the system was always open, and they could sit in the orderly room and hear what's going on in all the barracks all the time. So guys would stick their head into other guys' barracks. And they would say, Lieutenant Sherry is a fiend. <laughs> They'd go. And ten minutes later, you know, the brrr, down the weeds, they're in the weeds. <laughs> you wonder how we won the war, don't you? Well, well of course, uh, Lieutenant Sherry, he just knows this. He, so he was known as a fink, and that was the end of it. It was just, he, he, he'd sit there in his office, and hour after hour, you'd hear the PA say, Lieutenant Sherry is a fink, fink. <laughs> and he just said, they never pay a bit of attention. It didn't even dent his rhinoceros hide. Well, <laughs> we're... We're going along like that, and he was tough, and everything was pretty squared away. 
And then one day, out of the clear blue sky, we have a company, a company formation, and Lieutenant Cherry is standing out there in front, and it's kind of raining, you see. <laughs> it's kind of raining, and there's another guy standing next to him, kind of in the back of him, a bigger guy, by the way, bigger guy in the raincoat, and the, the water's hitting him on the head, and he's standing there, another guy, and we're all huddled there in our raincoats, and Lieutenant Cherry says, man... I want all of you to meet Lieutenant Johnson. This is Cliff Johnson, Lieutenant Cliff Johnson. Uh, Lieutenant Cliff Johnson is going to be my exec. You guys got any gripes, any problems? Lieutenant Johnson will take care of them. Lieutenant Johnson is the new executive officer. Johnson, I'm going to turn the platoon, uh, turn the company over to you right now. And uh, if you have anything you'd like to say to the boys, go right ahead. Well, we stood there, and that instant, without a word being spoken, 276 guys immediately recognized the enemy. Immediately we recognized, here's a patsy. <laughs> he just, and he stood up, and he says, all right, man, attention. And we all stand up, making, right away, it, it had already started. You could see guys leaning backwards vaguely, some guys with their stomachs sticking out, even under their, under their wrinkles, other guys are lynching. Men, I want to say this. You guys play ball with me, I'll play ball with you. Nobody who's ever known in the past, who's ever been in any outfits that I've ever been in, has known that you play fair with me, I'll play fair with you. Oh, boy, what cliches. This guy is coming out with every old canard and clinker in the book, and I can hear guys right behind me. We're going to make this into the best damned outfit in the whole damned army. Yeah, man, we're going to make this into the best damned outfit, into the best damn... <laughs> goes like that. That's all. all righty, you know, the poor guy is, is about ten yards behind his own goal line and about to fumble, only he doesn't know what you see. <laughs> well, <laughs> 15 minutes later, 15 minutes later, the whistles start to blow, and Lieutenant Johnson is going to have his first big formation. And Lieutenant Johnson has us all lined up out there between the latrine and the orderly room when the first movement started to happen. He is standing there, and it's raining yet, you know. He says, all right, man. Lieutenant Cherry and I have discussed the question of drill. And we have decided that this outfit needs a little more close-order drill. I know a lot of you are going to have plenty of gripes. And it's going... It's raining down everywhere. Everybody is standing there absolutely stony-faced, just looking out. A lot of you are going to have grapes, but we're in this war to win this war. This guy is fresh out of VMI. You can see it. You know, he's about nine days out of his, of his uh, sociology three classes. We are in this war to win this war, and we're going now to the drill field, and we are going to drill until I am satisfied, attention. Huh? Right face, forward heart. coming, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see out of this, this great herd of bumping up and down green helmets, bumping up and down green raincoats, and bumping up and down green gas masks, this great herd of mushrooms. <laughs> Suddenly, one guy's head goes, whoop, whoop, straight up in the air. There's a trick you do that you roll up on the ball of your arch, and you just go straight up without missing a beat. Whoop, whoop. Lieutenant Johnson looks over there, and it's up, boop, boop. another head goes up. He can't stop, boop, boop, like that. Ah, company, halt! Left, haste! Rain comes down. I don't know what kind of an outfit this, this gang is used to being, but we are going to make this the best damned outfit in the best damned army. <laughs> He's standing there. All right, now, I don't want any more fooling around. I have the authority of Lieutenant Cherry to break any man in this outfit. You understand? <laughs> you understand? He's talking to about, he's talking to about, about 260 of the most grizzled, hardened, totally cynical privates that you ever saw in your life. People with about nine corporals who couldn't have cared less about getting busted. He didn't write it up. Somehow that always uh, that always makes an officer think that scares you right out of your shoes getting busted. You know, bust, busted, busted. So, all right, all right. Company, face, hut. right face, forward, heart. Well, 
from that day on, it continued. Every time Johnson got us out, little things, little niggling things, heads popping out, guys dropping <laughs> raincoats out of their pack, guys dropping. I, I'll never forget the time he hollers, Gas! Gas! We're out running, you know, gas. He's hollering gas. Well, there was a rule in the Army that when you had... You, one thing you could never do was to keep anything extraneous, extraneous at all, in your gas mask. An absolute rule. Gas! Gas! Again, it's raining. You see all these guys with the helmets and all with the rain. Gas! You see candy bars, apples, footballs. <laughs> Things I can't even describe. All kinds of sandwiches. Pickles, everything is flying up. And he's looking, he sees all the groceries bouncing around in the cans and stuff. Oh, oh, hey, hey, you guys. Boy, that time we all got our gas masks on, standing there with the big goggles looking. <laughs> Poor old Lieutenant Johnson. I, I never forget that. Then the final thing came when Johnson had us out in the rain. I think I told you this story. This is always raining. This was, it was raining 24 hours a day. And it was raining, raining, raining. And Johnson had us out in the rain, and he was, oh, boy, he was bugged. Oh, boy, he was bugged. We were nothing at all like the platoon that he had at VMI, you know, <laughs> the underclassmen. Nothing like the crowd that he had at OCS. All of a sudden, these are rotten soldiers, haven't been overseas, you know. They, 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 they knew the story. So we are out running along a gravel road, and this nut had an idea. What he was going to do was to get everybody to run and have a gas attack at the same time. Have you ever tried to breathe through a gas mask? running at, at top speed in the rain in a G.I. raincoat. Well, I'll tell you, you think isometric exercises are great. You ought to try this one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so old Johnson, he's really got to see where he gets on. Oh, hey, gas, 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 gas. He's yelling, see, gas, gas, you know, gas for crying. Gas. Oh, we've been getting his gas from him for years. Gas, gas. So, all right, we put, blah, 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 we put on the gas mask, and, and we're still slogging along. We got our rifles are hitting us on the back of the head and the canteens and junk. And then with that, he hollers, double time, double time. <laughs> we're running, and, and where they got the gas, shoo, the sweat is coming down, and your ear balls are popping, you know, your eyes are sweating. <laughs> well, about that time, I hear the first one, <laughs> you hear this wild chicken coming out of this crowd of gas masks. It's what? What? What's going on? And somebody hollers, Lieutenant Johnson is a freak. <laughs> With that, the whole company is yelling stuff behind their gas mask. You couldn't see anything. And we go running past another company that is going in the opposite direction with a very official looking lieutenant colonel. <laughs> Ooh. He turns and he stops. He says, All right. At ease. At ease, man. And he's standing there, and his gas mask is hanging at half mask. <laughs> he's just sort of sweating. <laughs> he's a big son of a gun. And we're all standing there looking very innocent, our gas mask there. Oh, by the way, another thing. There wasn't a single guy, had we been gassed in that company, Eddie, would have lasted for more than ten seconds. Each one of us had taken the filter out of the cone. Out of the nose cone, you see, because you can't breathe in a gas mask with the filter in. <laughs> we had just taken that, thrown that out years ago. So our gas masks were just sheer, you know. <laughs> so, so we're all standing there with our gas masks and the candy bars falling again, and everybody's wet. They're sweating through their raincoats. And, and there's a great, a fantastic, it must have been like Farkas. There's a great feeling of total victory. We're just sort of standing there. He, we knew he was on the run. And poor old Johnson is standing. All right, now. Do you know who that man was that just went past us? That was the battalion colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Watson. If, oh, oh, well now, uh, right face, forward march. And we go marching away. Well, two days later, Lieutenant Johnson is transferred. Lieutenant Cherry... The afternoon that poor old Johnson left in the Jeep, I'll never forget the afternoon they left, because the rumor is out immediately. The word comes from the, from, the, from the orderly room, the corporal who's under, hey, hey, he's been transferred, he got his orders, you know. I don't know, now, uh, you know, it's probably get him, oh boy. Yeah, it's all right. 102nd Airborne, oh boy, they're giving it to him. <laughs> and 
And so immediately, you see, everybody's out there watching, sneaking and looking out of the barracks. And sure enough, you see poor old Johnson coming out of the orderly room. He's got his big envelope under his arm, you know, and he's shaking hands with, with Lieutenant Cherry, and he's wearing his dress uniform, and there's a jeep with his barracks bags. He's leaving the BLQ. And he goes down. Somebody goes, hey, so long, Lieutenant. So long. Good luck, Lieutenant. And they went, so long, Lieutenant. And he throws us a snappy salute. He's off to win the war. He throws us a snappy salute. We see the Jeep turn left and go on down towards the gate. So long, Lieutenant. You're a good guy, Lieutenant. You're a good guy. And about 15 minutes later, Lieutenant Cherry has us lined up. He says, now look, company. Don't think you pulled anything over on me. I know what you guys did to Johnson. I know what you guys did to Johnson, and I am not saying to you that Johnson did not deserve it. But the next time one of you guys gets out of line, Corporal! Hey, Corporal! I'm straightening up back. All of a sudden, the company is a fantastically different company. Oh, boy. Everybody's standing up. Corporal! Corporal! Ten minutes later, we get an exec officer that trained under King Kong and Attila the Hun. That guy came in. I don't know where they got him. He was an 82nd Airborne reject. He was too tough. He came in. He was nine feet tall. You could hear his head bumping on the seating in the latrine when he was walking bent over. He came in and he took all of the second platoon and bumped their heads against every head in the first platoon. Like a bunch of bowling balls getting batted together. You never saw a bunch of flatter stomachs in your life. Let's go there. That's enough of that. I got a lot of these little things to do here. Let's see here. Uh, uh, the Federation of the Handicapped, 211 West 14th Street, New York 11. They'd appreciate your... These are all these are all charities that would like your money. Comeback, 16 West 46th Street. What's this for? Oh, I see. Chronic impairments. And here's another one. Uh, Foster Parents Plan, Box 944, New York 8. These are all various things that if you would like to contribute, they would be delighted to have you do so. But you know, you know, I, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm really thinking about the connection between this sensation of, of, of observing we are in the hands, the clutches of a non-leader. I, 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 I'm thinking about this in connection with, 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 with presidential elections. Oh, there's nothing that scares you more than to look into the eye of your president and see he's not, you know, where do you go from here? Where, where? You know, you kind of wish for Richard the Third, Richard the Lionhearted to come back and lead a crusade or so, you know, march or something. And I can still see somewhere along the line Miss Robinette's look and smell that perfume, evening in Paris, floating through the Warren G. Harding corridors. Miss Robinette's eyes red. Lieutenant Johnson's look of sheer stark terror when he saw that first helmet bob up in the darkness. He knew he was a phony. He knew he couldn't make it, you know. He knew it. Wherever he went, the 102nd Airborne, the same thing must have happened. 